Yeah, I'll get this one back to this one. How did this one go? Not too bad. This one I was I was legitimately worried about. Really? I'll tell you on the delay for Well, I don't know what you guys. I generally predict incorrectly, so. I'll tell you about the delay for Unless I think it's right. Well, yeah. I don't know. Since you were worried about it, I probably got it wrong then. Well, the ones that I think that are. The calculation ones, at least when I go when I was a student, anything that was plugged stuff into equations, that was generally pretty easy. It was anything that was manipulate equations or derivatives, and that's kind of what that one was more of. But it was also based on one you gave us. True, just. Yeah, it was just move equations around, but you know, had that scary you know, derivative sign and whatnot. So. Okay. Um, um, there was okay. It has the scary derivative. Oh, okay. They said there was no. I'm sorry. I didn't know. Okay. So, everything we discussed last time, when I was in the the end conclusion that we came to that was kind of neat about it was that uh, we saw three examples. First, the, the laser, which is my favorite example. Um, when I first started to understand this and looked at the laser, I think that that is really cool. I think the laser took the hole and all of a sudden I put this pattern on the other side, which when I start to think about that more, it, it doesn't make any sense unless the uncertainty principle tells you that there has to be some unknown momentum component. The laser all of a sudden can't be going just straight. It can't just go through that hole and only some of the light go through. If that's the case, all of a sudden you would know that the momentum was in this tiny little range like this, as well as the position was only in a tiny fraction of the laser. That can't happen. Which is also just interesting from the, the point of view of just even creating a laser in the first place. Why can't you create a really tiny skinny laser? It's impossible. It is actually impossible to do. You have to create a laser with a certain width of its beam. If you tried to create a very tiny laser that was really thin, it would come out with a flashlight. Because all of a sudden, you've uh, pinned down the position and you would have to let go of the momentum component and it would come out with this. So there are fundamental limits on this stuff and things that we can actually see. All right, so that was the first example. The second example we talked about was waves. Okay, we talked about whether or not if your wave, um, if your wave function, if your angular frequency is really well known, if your wavelength is really well known, then you don't have a, a darn clue where your position of the particle in the wave is. You lose that information. You need to know one or the other. So these two graphical um, examples are really solid ways that at least we can kind of grasp onto saying the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is something real, something very real. Now the third one, which we can't really grasp onto, but does explain something we've been told, is that these electrons orbit around nucleuses, okay? and specifically the hydrogen atom. The electron cannot just go sit on the nucleus. It's impossible to happen. And the reason being is that it's such a small amount of space that the electron cannot operate on such a small amount of space. It has to have a larger location than that. So it has an uncertainty that is going around it if it has um, it has a certain amount of momentum that it is moving. Now, there's an obvious question here. Um, anybody question this idea of the atom or things that we're not really answering? What do you got? So, with, with the atom thing, correct. So you have the particles and you can't place the atom exactly. Right. So, it's probably a stupid question. So how do you know stuff like exactly how many of those are going on at different levels than like because in that classical you could tell by simple things like um, angular momentum is a, is a huge case if we get to that point um, the electron has a certain amount of mass which contributes a certain amount of angular momentum to the system uh, as a function of that mass so I can say I've got an orb of gray, as Brad was talking about it, that's contributing this amount of angular momentum that is specific to the electron. No, I can't go find the electron, but I can then say that that has to be one electron. So a lot of stuff with atoms just become, well, I know I have this fact and this fact and this fact, therefore this has to be true about the electron, even though I can't pinpoint it. Exactly. So you have to, um, anytime you're working with something small, you say, okay, we want to look at the existence of the Higgs boson. Okay, let's go take that. When they went over to CERN and they have these detectors, they ran these things up to, I think, what was it, what was it 14 TeV that they finally ran? I forget what the collision uh, energy was. But they ran this together. They didn't have a little guy down there with a the microscope saying, I found you. No, they have, they have other experiments that determine that 
it did exist because of its angular momentum. We, or we recorded this. We recorded the effects of the particles. We don't ever actually just you know, paint them red and count them. That uh, rarely happens. Now, the point I'm getting to is this. And we're just going to keep this in mind. We keep talking about this electron, and I'm, I'm saying that the electron cannot just sit on the photon because if its position is even just well known to this magnitude, then its momentum has to be unknown to a larger magnitude, and therefore it's going like crazy around this area. What is the next obvious question that says, well, what about... I'm trying to lead you without actually... Yeah! What about the friggin' stuff at the center? How on earth is that just sitting at the center then? This Heisenberg uncertainty principle is it dominates everything. It's not just the electrons, it's everything. So why can this stuff have this finite location and finite momentum, which we're taking to be zero-ish? How does this possibly happen? Any thoughts? Is that new with the charm? Nope. <laughs> it turns out Heisenberg uncertainty principle still has to dominate all materials, so it still dominates here. So how is this just sitting here? One of those components, the delta x, and, or the change in momentum, the delta momentum, uh, has to be large, large relative to Planck's constant. Which one is it? Perfect. No, because that's the one where we know it's right here in the center. Delta, the unknown in the momentum, or the unknown in the position is, is actually really, really small. The reason is because the unknown in the momentum is large. Now, if the unknown momentum is large for the whole nucleus, for the protons and the neutrons, why doesn't it have some sort of giant sphere of location, of movement? What is momentum? A quantity of mass times velocity. So this thing can have a tiny, tiny velocity, even just an orbital velocity. And because of its mass, all of a sudden its uncertainty and momentum is huge. Okay. Uh, this is you know, 10,000 times more massive than the electron, and therefore can be 10,000 times more likely to be located. And this is where that whole mass idea comes in. Us, we are here. We have such a small wavelength, and as do these particles, because they're so massive in the scheme of things, they have such a small wavelength that their uncertainty of position is very small, and their uncertainty of momentum makes up the whole rest of the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We just don't care because the mass dominates that. So if you have, I'll write it like this, uncertainty mass velocity times the uncertainty in x, it's got to be greater than or equal to the first bar over 2. So if I factor out mass, it's mass times the uncertainty in velocity in the x direction times the uncertainty in the x is greater than or equal to the principle. If this is large, even mildly large, both of these can be approximately zero. So close to zero that it just doesn't matter. And the mass makes up the difference. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle only makes uh, issues for things when you're talking about small x and small mass, both of these things have to be existing. So what's considered small mass? Electron is small. Electron is small, and anything bigger than electron is kind of big. So we basically got to go electron is small. So. so what about slow velocity, though? Slow velocity um, is fine, because if you have slow velocity, if you start to slow things down, then you end up with a mush of position. Okay. Still assuming that you have small mass. Again, the mass will mask everything out if it gets a little bit larger. All right, so something else that was interesting. This is the only way your book really goes into this, so I do want to emphasize it. Um, let's say you believe your position for an object to be x out here. Okay. So that means your uncertainty, I'm going to try and draw a similar picture to what you have in your book. Your uncertainty in your position here is going to be delta as opposed to, let's assume here for the scale, that you assume that your, posi your position is here is going to be at x equals 0. Your uncertainty in your position is going to be right there. Why does this matter? Because 
And the book says this and then goes on to completely ignore its own point. When your position or your velocity is expected to be zero, and we're dealing with the uncertainty principle, we can say that the change in momentum in the x direction is close in the same sorts of numbers as the momentum itself. We expect the momentum to be zero or very near to zero. So as things start to slow down, as our velocity is zero, therefore our uncertainty terms are going to be equal to this. And that's how we saw the hydrogen atom <coughs> on yesterday. We assumed that since we thought it was at the center, we said the maximum place it could be would be the, the maximum uncertainty. So the same thing is true for x. The change in x is on the order of x. Up here, you can't say that. The uncertainty in x is, has nothing to do with x. x could be all the way out here at 5 meters or something. Obviously, the uncertainty is not plus or minus 5 meters. Okay? It's going to be a very, very tiny amount. And the same thing is true for the momentum. We have to be careful in doing this, more careful than the book certainly is, in distinguishing whether or not you expect these quantities equal to zero. If they are, you can use these interchangeably. If not, then you can't. You'd have to say x plus or minus your uncertainty. Actually, technically, it would be plus or minus your uncertainty over 2. The uncertainty usually is considered both size. Okay, so let's go through another example problem that will help prep for the test. Yeah. Oh, something that I will say now, I'll try to say on Tuesday, and I may or may not say on Thursday. When you start to involving problems that have any sort of velocity, if you get any numbers that end with 10 to the 6th, we'll just use this as a basis. Now we're on the order of about 1% C. You have to go back and use relativistic kinetic energy. Okay. So anything 10 to the 5th and lower, don't worry about it. It's below 1%. So just be careful whenever you're doing this. And even when we're dealing with the hydrogen atom here right now, we're going to use uh, regular classical kinetic energy, which is questionable whether or not you can even do that. There are relativistic effects in electrons, especially when you get to the higher order electrons. At the low energy, at the uh, ground state energy that we're talking about, the closest electron, you can kind of get away with using classical kinetic energy, but it's close. Okay? So on your test, that is what I'm going to use as the dictation as to whether or not you should be using. And you'll make it clearly fall in one or the other, right? It clearly being 10 to the 6th or higher. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, we're playing exam Thursday. Yeah, exams on Thursday over chapters 3 and 4. So this, is, this is the exam that should be easy for everyone. It's just mostly plug some stuff into equations. Uh, Are you giving us the make, equations? Yes. Yes, I'll give you the equations. Because I actually assume we got equations at this point. Yes, I will do my best to get them to in advance as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, fun. Okay. All right, now, question, uh, example 4.6. Now, I'm going to read off your book. I'll give, I'll give you back your book. Though. I'll just have one in your book, guys. Okay. Example 4.6 reads, an electron is held in orbit about a proton in electrostatic attraction. So the same thing, we've got, the same idea we have here, but it doesn't, there we go, we've got our hydrogen atom. Okay. Now, in its total mechanical energy is the sum of its kinetic energy and electrostatic potential energy between the charges. So what's going on? We have two different types of energy that the electron has. It obviously has kinetic energy because it's moving. The other one is it has electric, uh, electrostatic potential energy um, because it's attracted to the proton. So we can say energy total can be kinetic plus our electric potential. All right. So it gives us an equation, which I'm going to modify here in a second. So if an electron behaves as a classical particle, it must obey F equals MA. Now that's the interesting part here. Now every time we deal with particles, we say force equals mass times acceleration, which can be applied to a particle. You can't really do that with waves. Waves work differently. You can't just apply a force and expect the whole wave to move together like a particle would. So we're going to look at the same problem treating assuming the electron is a particle, and then we're going to look at it assuming the electron is a wave and see what the difference is. All right. Uh, assuming circular orbit apply F equals MA to eliminate the velocity in favor of the radius and the energy expression and demonstrate that energy has no minimum. Okay. So let's start with this. So part A wants us to ask, treat it like a particle. 
and look at the energy. So here's our energy equation for this as a particle. That's what you're to make sure you All right, ut equals k plus ue. Now, if we're going to use classical kinetic energy, we can say one half mass of electron and velocity squared. We're going to have to figure out what that is. Now, we also have our uh, electrostatic potential energy. Anybody remember the way that we write this using Coulomb's constant? First of all, what is Coulomb's constant? Oh, well, head by epsilon. It does. It's got all sorts of junk in it. What is the, the letter that we use to represent it? Anybody remember? I don't know if it's in the front or not. P? Nope. That's speed of light. K. One, one again. K. There you go. K, Coulomb's constant. Coulomb's constant is yep. given as K. It is up there? Yeah, the other one is like 1 4 pi e to the zero. Yeah. 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Now, in this class, as in all my classes, if you remember from 2212, we're going to just, we're going to take this as 9 times 10 to the 9, which is lovely to throw in your calculator because it's just 99. And I like that. Newtons, meters squared per Coulomb squared. So we can run around with this. So, what do we have for the electrostatic potential energy? In fact, I'm going to write some equations over here. So this is all in review of 2212 or 2202, if you're doing that for this room. Now, what is UE? Remember the equation? It is in your book, but using Coulomb's constant. Because I want to know, and here I'll forecast what I'm looking for. I want to know the electrostatic force and the electric field equations. Anybody remember any of these? I don't know about three terms in it, that's about it. If I remember that, uh, Actually, there are only three terms in it. You're right. Because we simplified it all. I got kind of mass in it, but I thought a mass. Nope, there's no mass at all. I'm done. Similar to the gravitational law. Yeah, they're all very. Oh, yes, Newton's gravitational law. Uh, Newton's gravitational law of F of G. He's going to hate me when I believe this, but that's okay. M1, M2 over R squared. Yes, that is very, very true, isn't it? Something like so, A um, times. Well, we can do the very same thing. K. Now, what is. Now, in. Gravitational law, whenever you have a force, you have to look at what object or what property material has that that force is acting on. So for the gravitational field, it's mass. That is what is gravity acts on is mass. So for electric fields, it's obviously your charge. So we have here Q1, Q2, and then the radius is still the same thing. They're all over R squared functions for forces. So if we fill that one in first. You don't have it as R squared. What? I know. The property of forces. So I can write this as kq squared over r squared. That is the force between two particles. Now, the potential is actually just given as kq over r squared. Or r, sorry, q squared over r, I'm using my own. And the electric field is the opposite. kq over r squared. So all three just have all three terms. It's just a question of which one is squared. It's now, Q1 and Q2. Q1 and Q2. Now, I'm automatically assuming, since we're dealing with electrons and protons, they have the same charge, equal and opposite. So in this case, for the electrostatic potential energy, we're going to end up having this negative energy, which I'm going to go into in a second. I was going to leave that off right now. But. So, all right. Now, over here, if we look at this, when we talk about gravitational potential energy, we write this as mg y or something to that effect, some sort of height difference between them. But if we actually space this out, this is the acceleration due to gravity, which is this function right here. So we would have g m1, and then we end up with uh, we're going to say times our mass that we already had in there over r squared, and then we've just got sorry r squared here times some sort of height, which in this case would be equivalent to the radius. MGR. These cancel. And we end up back with the same equation that we had here. So we don't normally write our gravitational potential energy like this, but we could. So they're all of the same function. Drew, you just had 2212 just this last semester, right? Yeah. 
You were lucky. You had the sheet that I handed out that showed the crossover between everything. Oh, yeah. 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 You, were, you were in it, too. Yeah. So I really improved. You, were like you guys had it hard. That was the first time I taught it. I, I, I used that section up quite a bit. I had a high school right. teacher who also had it. And he was all high. Yeah. All right. Now, back to the stuff. So if that's the case, I'm going to write my uh, particle energy here as dt equals one half mv squared plus q yeah k okay, kq squared over r. Now the question is, this is not going to be a plus. This is actually going to be a minus because the it's in charges. Okay. One. All right, next, go ahead. Yes. So if it was a helium atom and it was only had one <coughs> hydrogen, right? Sure. Huh? Hydrogen. Or are you saying one if it was helium? Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yep. So that means you would have two Qs. I mean, well, you'd have Q to the star. Okay. Uh, or you'd have you two times. Would. You would. No, you would have two Q squared. Because what you would have is... Um, you have 2e in the center multiplied by negative e in the charge between. Because the charge in the center would be this. Now, of course, there'd be other electrons that's out there that also can be those things. No, I'm saying that you only have one. You have one photon. Oh, okay. Somehow. So, so somehow. He, no, it's a helium ion. That's yeah. fine. So you have a helium ion, and then what happens? Yeah, it would be that. Okay. All right. So back to this. We get the minus q, uh, q squared over r. Now, the, the whole bit about f equals ma. The point of that is that we're trying to get rid of this velocity term. And we can do that because we're saying that if this thing is in uniform circular motion, we can define this as our radius, we have to have some sort of acceleration, some sort of force that's pulling us in. So the weird thing about this is, even though this has some sort of uh, energy, some sort of uh, potential energy just from existing, it would have that energy if it was just sitting there, just sitting still. The fact that it's moving around in this circle means it has that kinetic energy, and that's also due to the attraction. So both those energies are due to the same thing. Okay. So we can say that there's going to be some sort of F net equation, which is going to be equal to mass times acceleration, which will equal M <coughs> squared over R. This gives us a nice review in uh, orbital motion, uniform circular motion, where that's our acceleration. Now, our force that we're going to be dealing with here is the Coulomb force that we were talking about over there. So we'll have this is going to be equal to k q squared over r squared. Now we can solve all this for r, move everything around and figure out. No, we want to solve this for v, my bad. So v is going to end up being k q squared over m r. Which is perfect. Well, I'm getting there. So we could square this, or I'm sorry, take the square root of this. But when we plug this back in, we're going to be plugging it back in here as a square angles. So we can just go ahead and leave this as squared. That works out just fine for us. And you don't have to deal with any negatives with the Qs? Not as of right yet, because we have a force. We can say what direction this is. The idea of a force, the negative signs get really obnoxious when dealing with forces. For those of you guys who remember in the 2211 and 2201 courses, I would say keep everything positive. I kind of go against the textbook on this and say, screw that, use intelligence, leave everything positive and say, what direction is my force inward? This is pulling me inward. And whenever we do uniform circular motion, we always say that the inward direction is positive. It's an easier way to handle things is to set it up that way. Same thing with acceleration. If you guys remember when we had blocks that went like this, I said, screw it. If this is the heavier block and you're going this way over the pulley, set this way is positive. Set down is positive. They keep your acceleration and everything else is positive. It's just my philosophy on how we do this stuff. All right, so yes, we're going to keep everything as positive. In fact, I was going to keep this as positive, but I'll explain where this negative uh, comes from in a little bit. All right, so then our ET here is going to be equal to one half times the quantity kq squared over mr. Now, this is multiplied by the mass, though, so the mass is actually canceled. And now I also have kq squared over r here. I've got the exact same function. Which shouldn't be terribly surprising, seeing as how it's the same uh, 
affect the same phenomenon that is controlling us here. That leads me to get a negative k q squared over 2r left over. So this is my UE, this is my potential energy, this is my kinetic energy. My potential energy is twice that of my kinetic energy. And the reason that when, when you take the kinetic energy and subtract potential energy, you still end up with a negative number because the potential energy is dominant. Okay, now let's go on to talk about uh, what this necessarily means. As r gets smaller, as this thing starts to get closer and closer to here, what's going to happen? Well, this term is going to go up and this term is going to go up, so we're going to have this term going up in magnitude, but getting more and more negative. Now we've got to remember back to electrostatic potential. What the heck does it even mean to have a negative potential energy? And it's the way the electric potential is defined. Electric potential is defined like this. All right, here we have negative infinity, which is known as the lowest energy. The lowest energy you could possibly have is negative infinity. Now, over here at zero, zero is the max energy, which is really, really weird. Okay. Now, just like choosing zero points when we had gravitational potential energy, you choose the zero any place you want, it doesn't matter. Mathematically, it just makes sense for electric potential energy to choose zero to be the max and everything else is negative. So the more negative the value you have, the less potential energy it actually is. The most potential energy you could possibly have is zero. Just kind of weird and there's no good way to bother this. But it's the same in 2212 if you remember back to that when we dealt with this. So, point being is that this can go down and down and down and have more negative energy, which is actually less energy. Again, the zero point doesn't necessarily matter. And this should be able to go down forever. Alright. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What did you say? So, like, like when electrons jump to the high energy level, they have less That energy. Yes. But they have. Which is actually more energy. Yeah. They have a less negative potential energy, yeah. which means it's more energy. Yeah. And it still works out in the energy equation. Because if you have your change of energy in the system, okay, and let's say you change your kinetic energy plus change and and this, okay, say your kinetic energy goes up. Okay, now I'm at a, a kinetic energy of five where I was at two. Yay! And this went from negative two to negative one. I'm like, what? Okay, I got less negative. I guess that's a good thing. Or if it's the other way around, in this case, you had a bunch of positive energy, which means that you had some sort of positive work that was done on the system. But it could have gone the other way. You could say that this is equal to zero, and instead you had negative energy of two. Now you have negative energy of four. Actually, that would be too high. For that. So in the energy equation, it still works out. A negative value in there is still a bad thing. The more negative it is, the more bad it is, the less energy it is. Just kind of weird. Okay. So we have that over there. This is our final result, so I'm going to leave that up here. Now, part B reads, suppose now the electron is behaving like an orbital wave. Okay, here, particle, the B wave. Now what happens? Now if we're treating the electron as a wave instead of a particle. The energy expression decreases as both position and r, position r and momentum mv approach zero. Assume that each is very small and thus comparable to the respective uncertainty. The uncertainty principle implies that pr is proportional to h bar. Use this to eliminate velocity. Okay, what does any of that mean? Uh, the idea being is they want to get rid of velocity again, but let's start slowly. Okay, note that as the radius gets smaller, the energy expression decreases and the momentum goes to zero. What does that mean? That we're saying that as the energy gets smaller, this thing is not moving around as much, so the momentum is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So we're able to use the idea that the change in momentum x 
is going to be proportional to our change or to our momentum. So whatever our un sorry that change uncertainty, whatever our uncertainty is, we can assume that that's on the order of our actual values for the momentum. Same thing for true for x. So, and in this case, instead of x, we're going to say r. We want to say that these two things are proportional to each other. Therefore, we can say that the change of px by the change of r is going to be greater than or equal to h bar over 2. Well, not therefore, that's just the uncertainty principle. Now, for our x value, we're talking r, because that's the distance away from where we think we are. Again, we're taking the electron to just be, the assumption is that it is at the center. And this is how far it has to be away as a minimum. OK, now the book is saying this is true, and this is fine, but we can even say that our uncertainty is larger than this. Let's just go ahead and say that our uncertainty is on the order of, uh, if, wait, I'm sorry. What I meant by this, if these two things are true, this and this up here, then I can just write that PR is greater than or equal to H bar over 2. Our actual values for these two things are going to be that. And if they're going to be greater than that, let, the book is just going ahead and saying, let's just set them equal to h bar. It's possible they could be a little bit smaller than that, but we're just going to take an approximation. We've doubled Planck's constant, which was already times 10 to the minus 34. I don't think that's going to hurt anybody. So this is just an approximation, but it allows us to run with this. But the book doesn't explain where this comes from, so I just want you guys to see this. All right, that's the assumption we're going with, that the momentum times this radius is going to be equal to h bar. Now what? All right, if that's the case, I can write this as mvr is equal to h bar. Let me just expand out my momentum. And velocity is equal to h bar over mr. Now again, we're just dealing with classical momentum, too. If these velocities start to get larger, and the second we start to get to orbiting electrons that are in higher orders, you've got to start using relativistic momentum, too. So this gets really ugly. Let's just stick to the simple stuff. Okay. So we've got V equals H bar over MR. Let's go back and put this into our equation again. So we've got ET is going to be equal to 1 half mass times the quantity H bar MR squared minus KQ squared over R. So whether we're treating this as a particle or a wave, we still are dealing with the same original equation over here, which is in the middle of the second part. The only difference is how we treat the velocity. Are we talking about the velocity as a wave, as the whole thing, kind of, or are we going to treat it as the velocity of the particle? Sorry. <laughs> so now, as a wave, we're going to use the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, saying, yeah, this is kind of dominated by here, our h bar over mr. All right, so if we multiply all this through, we end up with an equation that says we've got h bar squared over 2mr squared minus kq over r. Now what happens? Now, if we look at this, this is over r squared this time, our first term. Our kinetic energy is over r squared. Now, this is minus kq over r. So as r gets smaller, which one is going to be dominant and why? KQ. Yeah, no. Well, let's just think about it this way. We've got 1 over x squared minus 1 over x. So if we plot this for a while, let's deal with the number. Pick a number. Okay. 4. 4. All right. So we've got 1 over 16 minus 1 over 4. We're going to end up with a negative number. Okay. Now, as long as these numbers are large, this one is going to be dominant. The reason being is that we have large positive numbers that are squared in the denominator, and we end up with this negative number. Now, let's try 0.5. Okay, 0.5, I'm going to end up 1 over 0.25 minus 1 over 0.5. As the numbers start to get smaller, this becomes 4 minus 2. All of a sudden, we have a positive number. What's 0.5 squared? 0.5 squared is 0.25. Okay. You're just, everyone's looking at me like I'm an alien, so I don't yes. know what I did wrong here. No, no, nothing. Just, okay. Maybe oh, my like, mind's it, took, it took me a second to realize yeah. what the 4 and 2 is like. Well, I, yeah, that's, yeah. 
<laughs> I'm just going to open the clouds today. What's that? I'm just going to open the clouds today. Yeah. In any case, this one starts to become more dominant as the radius gets smaller. As we start to get to smaller and smaller numbers closer to zero, which obviously we're going to be dealing with tiny numbers from here, fractions of a millimeter, this thing starts to become dominant fast, hugely. Now, remember we said that this one, as this goes to infinity, this one becomes negative infinity, right? This one doesn't. As r goes to infinity, what does this one become? I'm sorry, as r goes to zero, what does this one become? Yeah. Positive infinity. So now I've got something that's running off to positive infinity and one that's running off to negative infinity. Who wins? Zero. Okay, everyone wins. Out. This one wins eventually. This one starts to win, and then this one does win. So I don't even know what's going on. This is as r is getting smaller. So if we just look at this as a plot now. Now we're saying that as r gets smaller, so big r is way out here. Let's plot this as r gets smaller. For a while, this one is dominant. And it's dominant to the point that we end up with negative numbers here. Like for Kyle's example, I had a negative number. So, and it becomes more negative as this goes. So we become more and more dominant until we start to get to the small numbers where the kinetic energy becomes dominant. And then it becomes dominant, 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 boom, and it takes off like that, off to positive infinity. Now, if we go back, and this is specifically for, this is an energy function, so I'm looking at energy. I really could probably you know, erase something, but This is for the wave. We're going to end up with something to that effect. Where it's going to become more and more negative until we get to very small numbers for the radius. And then this is going to take off. And I shouldn't have drawn it perfectly vertical. Definitely it's getting closer and closer to that. But it can never reach zero because it's obviously going to move up to infinity. So this is part C of it, which asks us to plot these. So we've already plotted the wave one. Now if we go back here and we plot this one as a particle, we say this is minus kq squared over 2r. So the only thing that's a variable in here is r. I am plotting 1 over negative r, or 1 over negative x, which is a well-known function that just looks like this. And then goes off, down and down and down. So there's actually a value where they're the same, incidentally, which is really close to also where they're the minimum amount of energy. It's not quite exactly if I remember, but it is close. Actually, it might be. It so might you're be basically zero. plotting together the one minus one over x squared minus one over x, and then one over x. Yes. Yes. So, and the other thing that's interesting is that when these get to large radiuses, when we talk about really far out, it doesn't matter whether or not we treat it like a wave or a particle. It's the exact same. And the reason being is that the electric potential energy goes to zero, or is getting close to zero, because R is getting large. So there's not much electric potential energy. And for that matter, there's not much kinetic energy in orbit. All right. So there is a minimum amount if we treat this like a wave. That's the important part that we're getting to. There is a minimum amount of energy that is allowable for the electron as a wave. Based on the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, there's only so freaking close that this thing can get. Now, that being only so close that it can get, that means that there's a certain energy associated with that. So what's going to basically happen is, once this thing is in here, it's in static equilibrium. It can get closer if you push it closer, but it requires energy. It's sitting down here in this bowl. It has the least amount of energy possible. If you try to push it away from the nucleus, that's actually not too hard to do. You can push it farther away from the jump levels, things like that. You try and push it towards the nucleus, you better have a whole lot of energy to do that because it's going to want to fall right back down. It, this is a huge increase in the gravitational or the electric potential energy and requires a huge increase in kinetic energy. The exact same example, this remember, this is still an electron going around in circles, right? Okay, let's take Cody's piece of shit Mustang. I was like thinking of this car. He doesn't have any more to sold it, so. <laughs> Let's say he starts doing donuts in it, and he's doing it around 100 meters, okay? So he's going around, going around, going around. Now you say, okay, I, what, what's easier to do, make smaller donuts or larger donuts? Larger. It's larger. It's much easier. You just go a little bit farther out, and you make larger loops. In fact, you probably go faster. If you, at some point, you're going to do, okay, turn harder. Um, 
No, it's not going to happen. It gets harder and harder to go around that tighter circle. In fact, you're going to roll the car. It's going to go flopping up. It's easier to go outside. That's the equivalent of trying to get up in here. It requires a whole lot of energy and a lot of friction on the tires to be able to keep something in orbital motion at really tight levels. Okay. So it's just a, a, an example, I suppose. All right, so now the last question we want to ask here is D. Find the minimum possible energy from the orbiting electron wave and the corresponding value of r. Okay, so let's find what this energy is. Now keep in mind we made some assumptions along the way. For example, we were just assuming that let's just take the momentum and times the radius and say it's equal to h bar. Well, we know technically it has to be uh, equal to or greater than h bar over 2. So again, it's just an approximation. And there's a reason the book made that approximation. All right. Now, how do we go about doing that? How do we find the minimum? How do you find the minimum of any function? Of any function? Any function. If I say I want to find the minimum of e to the x. There we go. Set the derivatives. So, you take the derivative of it, set it equal to zero, and solve it. You're finding minimums and maximums, right? That's what you just said. Right? So, so, all right, so we have to take the derivative of E, specifically E wave, as a function, this is part of D that we're working on right now, okay, as a function of R, so it's a position derivative. All right, so that's taking the derivative of D dr uh, h bar squared over 2 m r squared minus kq squared over r. So again, we'll work out the derivative slowly for those of you who might not have done this for a while. I can do this by parts. I can take the derivative of this section and then take the derivative of this section. So now, the only things that I'm interested in are the things that are derivatives with respect to r. Now notice this is a full derivative. That being said, everything in here is a constant and not a function of r, so we don't really care. This is the equivalent now of taking d dr of x the r minus 2 plus d dr minus y to the r minus 1. Why? Okay, what am I doing? Okay, these x's, this x is just everything in here that is not a function of r. So in this case, it's h bar squared over 2n. Now, the r to the minus 2 is just I want to write this in the numerator so that in a moment I can use the derivative law that says nx to the n minus 1, which I assume you guys remember. Remember? Sweet. All right, same thing here. This is minus y, and it's all the crap that's over here. So the derivative of this is going to end up being minus 2x to the r to the minus 3, plus I end up with a positive y uh, to the r minus 2. So I can say that that derivative, if I write this up here, minus 2x, my x was this h bar squared over uh, 2mr. So that ends up, the 2s end up canceling, and that'll end up with h bar squared over m times r to the minus 3, if you believe. Is it a negative? And the negative sign. We gained a negative sign now. All right, and the, and the next one is plus whatever this was, minus y to the r minus 1. All right, well, that's easy. So I had a minus of, or, oh, I'm sorry, down here, y r to the minus 2. So I just end up with the kq now over r squared instead of Still minus. And this is positive now. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we get the minus of the minus. This is what we said equal to zero. So, now what we're going to do is let's put, put the negative side over here and solve this thing for our, our, our r, our radius. Quick question. Yes. Actually, I shouldn't put that as a question. Okay, there we go. That's my question. Yeah, sorry, I threw that as r oh. to the minus 3. It's supposed to be r to the 3. It's already in the denominator. Yeah. Where did the 2 from this number go? Ah, it was canceled with this 2. Oh, okay. I kind of zoned out for a second. I missed that. Oh, you're fine, fine. Okay, so now I want to sit here and rearrange this thing and solve it for r. And I get r is equal to. Uh, I should have h bar squared over mk q squared. That q is not squared on the top one. 
squared over mk q squared. Yay. Now, we solved that. And we just put it in here for h bar squared, of course, the 1.055 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. Mass of an electron, 911 times 10 to the minus 31. K, 99 times uh, n, capital N, m squared over c squared. And then Q, the charge of the electron, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs squared. But all that jumped into here, and we should get an answer of 5.3 times 10 to the negative 11 meters. This is the minimum radius that the electron can actually exist in the lab. So really neat stuff. Then this is straight out of Heisenberg's uncertainty. Straight application of that and just energy analysis. Now this turns out to be an incredibly exact answer, and there's a bunch of uh, approximations we made, and the most of which, uh, by sending the PR to H bar exactly, it's still an approximation. Now it turns out that the momentum here is always greater than or equal to H bar over two, so it's quite likely that it could have been H bar. Turns out that it's in between H bar over two and H bar. It's in between that, and there's a couple other approximations that we made, but in any case. It works out really well because we end up with this answer. So then the next way to do this is we can put this back in and solve this back into our energy equation. Now that we know, here's our energy equation for E wave, and just plug in what we know for R and get a value, and we end up getting that E minimum uh, is going to be equal to negative 13.6 electron volts. And we can now say that this is the lowest energy state. Any place what? else that the electron exists will actually be at a higher energy level. What energy equation did you plug that back into? This one. Okay, so. What's in here? Oh, because this is the derivative of this one. I had to erase the yeah. equation. But E wave is this equation inside here. Good question. So in the book that has like E squared and stuff like that, is that just the charge of the electron? Yeah, whenever they're dealing with E squared, they're talking about charge of electron, and I, I'm used to using Q, so I'm just going to. Okay, this is a great example. This is something that could quite likely end up on your test because it requires you to remember back stuff that is in uh, 2212. And don't worry, I won't expect you to remember anything without telling you ahead of time. You need to know this. So I'm not going to just pull something out of nowhere. Like how last time you you seem to remember you didn't. Remember the what? No, last time the first exam, you assumed for that third problem that we remembered something that we didn't. The mv squared over r. I did think that you had remembered that. That assumed that I took 22, 11, and 12. You took 22, or 2. Yeah, but you took 22, 1 with me, and you did that in there. Lots. Good. Cool. In any case, didn't I write that on the board for you anyway? Yeah. Okay, so I don't feel so bad. Nichols. All right. Next. 3D Heisenberg. Nichols, 3D glasses. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is not even really anything uh, worth writing down per se, but just mentioning that so far we've been talking about the change or the uncertainty in momentum by the uncertainty in position. We're saying that this is greater than or equal to h bar over 2. Well, you need to do this in all three dimensions, and they are unrelated. This uncertainty. that you're working with, so it does change. And we can kind of see this with the laser. Huh? Do you have a laser? No, I had it here, just, I still have it here. Okay. Okay, so if I pass this through a very large aperture of the light, I end up with just a dot over there, the large aperture just being the end of the laser. Now the second I pass it through this direction, I end up with my pattern on the, on the wall, which you can see in that direction. And behind you. And, and what? And behind you. And behind me because of the reflection. All right. The slit is vertical. Okay. So I'm getting this, this pattern here that has an unknown change in the momentum. Which one's best? That doesn't really matter. You guys get the idea. 
I'm getting, what I'm pinning down is that I'm pinning down the x direction. The y direction, the slit is actually quite tall. So as far as the y direction goes, if I was to look at the height of this laser and go over there and measure it, I'm going to find that that's going to be the exact same height as the pattern on this. The pattern is no taller than it was before. Okay, It's just a lot wider. So the obvious conclusion, if I rotate this 90 degrees and now put the light through the same exact thing, now all of a sudden I'm going to have a vertical pattern. Okay, Because now I've pinned down the uncertainty in y, so I say, okay, you're a very exact y location, then nature says, screw you, then my momentum, I'm going to all of a sudden change my momentum. And you really are changing it. That's the weird part. This had a momentum of just being straight. Everything that came out of this was just going straight. So the very act of going through a small hole affected its momentum. It changed it. It all of a sudden went out that direction. So now this is a slit, a single slit necessarily is a constraint in one dimension of your aperture. So what happens if you constrain something in two dimensions? What would you expect to see? A box. If it was a constrained thing like that. What happens if it's a constrained dot? What if it's a circle? Larger circle? Yeah, why not? Let's see if I can even do this. We'll do it back there. Give him, give him the chalkboard. Yeah, I'm try it. So cheap, right? No. Yeah, no kidding. Is that? I see that. That is. That's, that's that. really cool. That's for what? That is not. <laughs> what it should be. Ah. Oh. <laughs> ah. Oh, darn. That's a full diffraction pattern. You can use on these. Not just a dot on here. I'm passing it, okay, well, what I'm passing it through here is, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm passing it through an octagon of, multiple, of several dots so you can see the octagon pattern. And then here, just through a square pattern. I thought there was circular aperture somewhere in here. Wait, oh, they're there. Right, okay, so they're there, I just can't do this. Is it too bright in here to see them? Yeah, go ahead and flip up the lights and see. Is there a video we can see? Yeah. Well, we're going to watch the video here in a second. Maybe that'll be something different. Yeah, that's the main way to do it. There it is. I should probably not shine it against the, uh, the lit wall there. There it is. Can you see it a little bit? Yeah, I'm having a hard time hitting this thing. Yeah, well, the point being is it's got bigger, though. The uncertainty goes in both directions. I'm having the hardest time hitting this thing. So the uncertainty is going to spread out um, in all directions. It's just weird to think about just because the photon passed through the hole, nothing else interfered with it. It says, I'm going to gain momentum this direction. How? Now, something else that's interesting, conservation momentum still exists. We say that there's an uncertainty in the momentum. So that doesn't mean that all momentum goes, we're all going to go up. No, the conservation of the momentum before the slit and after the slit still has to be true, so it has to be split even <coughs> the direction it goes. The momentum in the <coughs> direction is canceled, so we end up back with zero momentum in the x or the y direction, whatever which way you passed it through. Okay, next. Okay, math analysis. Yes, there's one other uh, section in this book, and it talks about energy and time. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is always usually introduced as a function of change in momentum over change in time. What that specifically means Let's, let's look at an example here. Okay, let's look at something like this. This is something that is really close to acting like a particle and really close to acting like a wave. It's kind of in between. So it mostly looks like a wave, but you can kind of say the particle's here-ish. Okay, it looks like it's kind of in this area. This looks like a pulse. 
Okay, so pulse becomes smaller. Of course, there's a limit of looking at something. It, I mean, it would look like this. And then, and then it gets more like that, and then eventually it's just one single spike up, and then it's a part. It's literally just one location. So we're somewhere in between this and the straight wave. Pretend it's a straight wave. Something's in between there. Now, that means that this is composed of multiple wavelengths. The wavelength is not really well defined. It's kind of in the region. It has an uncertainty. We can tell by just looking at it. That's not just one given wavelength. All right, so the more wavelengths you have, though, if you get to a point of infinite wavelengths, this, where you have the Dirac delta function, where you just exact one point, this would take an infinite wavelengths to do this. That means your position is really precisely known. Wavelengths are related to the wave number as 2 pi over lambda. Call that the wave number. Okay, that's saying that we can rewrite our uh, this equation as the uncertainty in the wave number, in other words, the uncertainty in our waves, multiplied by the uncertainty in x is going to be greater than or equal to 1 half. This is actually a mathematical formula that just refers to the construction of waves. This has nothing to do with physics at all. Math simply says, and that's the argument, that second argument I gave you guys yesterday, that if you have a wave that's composed of a bunch of like this, your, un, your position is unknown. It's something like this. I can't claim the wave to be at one spot, per se. It's more in this spot. Um, that these two numbers multiplied together has to be equal to 1 half. All right, now, the only reason the Heisenberg uncertainty principle came up is because a mathematician well, we've been saying lately that the momentum is equal to this h bar over k. That's why when we throw this in there, we end up with the, the change of momentum then is just a function of this h. That h is stuck with us times our change of momentum of x is greater than the h bar over k. So a mathematical formula, a physics new concept of the quantum error, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. But this is not the only thing that formulates like this, the wave number. There's something else. There's the angular frequency. The angular frequency which is taking this over 2 pi over t. 2 pi over t. Now, you guys remember this one, right? So this is the period. Now, this is specifically, um, your book writes this as lowercase t. I want to write it as capital T because we usually really call that as uh, the period. This is the period, but this is the period of the pulse. So I'm just curious as to what that is. Pulse time. Now, the same mathematical formula says that the change in uh, W is proportional to the change in this pulse time, which has to be greater than or equal to 1 half. Now, that kind of makes sense. We don't know what our angular frequency is if we don't know where our pulse time is. If I go over here and look at this, um, I need to rewrite this. I lied to you guys. This is capital T right here. This is going to be pulse time here. This is going to be the period for the wave. This is related to the wave. This is related to the particle. Just like over here, delta K, this is related to the wave. This is related to the particle. This part is not in your book, by the way. They skipped this to some extent. Um, all right. I don't know what my angular frequency is. I don't know what my period my my wave is if I don't really know my pulse time. If I want to go over here and I ask you, where is my pulse time? Well, it's definitely here. But where do I cut it off? Would I cut it off right here and say, well, it's when it starts to go up? Or should I include like this part in my pulse? Or maybe I should even start it out here. And this is the point. It's unclear as to where the pulse really begins. It's not exact. So there is an uncertainty in this. Well, our equations show us that the energy is equal to h bar over our angular frequency, or angular velocity, whichever way you want to write it. So I can put this in here and say that the uncertainty in my energy is uh, related to the uncertainty in my pulse time by the same h bar over 2. This is known as energy pulse time uncertainty. Now, in your book, it just calls it energy time uncertainty, which is fine. But you have to be clear as to whether or not you're talking about the period here of the wave or the pulse time, or just the amount of time that it is involved in the pulse. 
So we can also use this equation. And on Monday or on Tuesday, I'll give you a couple problems um, to practice with that. Some example problems to look at. It's the same equation you just manipulated in the exact same way. Point in fact, if we're going to have the test on Thursday, oh, what the hell am I going to do with that? Um, I will give you a, del a homework assignment tonight instead. Why don't we just push that test back away and you just lecture on Thursday? I thought about that. I don't really want to push it. We're going to be that far out of the material. I'm going to be lecturing on stuff on Chapter 5 that you won't need till later. I'd really rather do it this way, that we, we have the clean break, the day off, we've had a test, there's no homework, and then start back up. Plus, I will post. Okay. That's a plus that we can maybe look at hell at the three tests. I'm, I will post a homework assignment for you tonight, probably going to be two problems, three problems. Then I'll do a week from the day, I'll be doing the test. I'll be happy to answer any of the questions. I recommend you get them done by Tuesday, that you can look at them um, so I can help you out. But per usual, it'll always be due a week. I didn't think about this when I was planning ahead. So it'll be a couple different problems, and it's basically just going to be over this and a couple other things that we learned today. Um, we're out of time. Shoot. Okay. On Tuesday, what we're going to do is we're going to watch a video on Dr. Quantum that talks about more about this uncertainty thing and the unseen observer. So we'll do that Tuesday. Oh. Yeah, it's it's very weird. Um, but it's very real too. So is it going to break my mind? A little bit. <laughs> and I still don't like it. Because the problem with this video and every other thing that I've introduced is they introduce it to you, tell you that this is going on, and then never tell you why. And then largely because we don't really know. Oh, no, no. We don't know who it is. On Saturday, he looks at Justin Hunter and he's like, he, he tells them they won't understand any of this next presentation. He's like, you might, you might understand some of it. I decided to skip it. He goes and watches it and understand, he understands less than half of it. Yeah, man. It was not easy. I was like, why was I even like, you missed Tuesday. So you want to go through the way now? All right. All right, anybody else have their, uh, their assignment? Do I have everyone? Excellent. Dave, do you know yours? By the way, tomorrow I'm not going to be here, so we're scheduling everything for Monday. You're welcome no. if you want to go up and, and look at stuff yourself. But yeah. I'll, I'll just wait. I mean, that gives them more time to get everything in. Okay. For out the morning. It means so I can go home. Right. Yeah, I'm leaving for Pittsburgh tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Oh, I need to all my classes in my office hours are canceled tomorrow. Um, I would be happy to meet by appointment to make up for it, though, if anybody wants to talk to me. But you've got some going to Zelkai and this next week. Just go home and stuff. I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> what do you got going in Pittsburgh? Um, so, my best friend lives down in Florida, but he's a pilot, so he flies all over the place. So, he's flying candidate up to Penn State, yes. Um, and so, he's got the weekend up there. The, one of his clients is just likes to go to football games, so, charter planes to go. This guy has a lot of money. Um, so he's up here in Pennsylvania for the weekend. And of course, this client has to pay for his hotel and everything. So instead, he's taking that hotel in Pittsburgh and his rental car. So we're meeting up in Pittsburgh and uh, for a free hotel and run around for Halloween weekend. And then on Saturday, we're going to go see the pit game. So this isn't on the list. You're going to get drunk this weekend? There will be beer involved. I don't know how much. Well, you know you're still on camera, so. Well, that's true too. I mean, 